Hello, everyone, and good morning. Welcome to our DATIQ Weekly Market Update. This is our update for June 15th, 2021. I'm Ken Adamo, Chief of Analytics at DAT, joined by Ned Damon, Principal Data Scientist, and on location from a Hilton Garden Inn in Denver, Colorado, we have our Principal Market Analyst, Dean Croak. Welcome, guys. Good morning. Good morning. How was that grab-and-go stale muffin this morning, Dean? Uh, yeah, um, I didn't. Even, it didn't even get to the muffin. It was uh, everything's just still closed down, like in the hotels. They're still not geared up for travelers just yet. So I'm going to open the show with the idea that we have uh, Dean's shortage of the week, just to kind of. Uh, I think they call that in media a teaser because we're going to revisit right. that towards the end of the show. But uh, right, right. Uh, we have a lot of really interesting things to talk about this week. Uh, yeah. But most importantly, we like to use this time to answer your questions. So if you have any yeah. questions, comments, or thoughts, drop them in the chat or comment section below. Uh, we have marketing folks who will feed those over to us, and we'll get to them at the end. Last week, it was silent until half an hour into the show, and then we had a whole bunch. So if you can do us a favor and get those in early, that would be delightful. So mm -hmm. with that, I'm going to jump into our key points of the week. Some really interesting rating trends, and that's how we're going to open up uh, our key trends of the week. Things really remaining flat, um, really looking for direction is what I think they'd say if you were studying stocks um, with that Ivy League degree on Wall Street. So what we're really trying to time and watch is this period right before the ramp up heading to 4th of July where everything tends to peak. Dean's going to cover that in more detail here in a few minutes. Imports up in May. Um, kind of dovetailing into, I highly recommend searching um, through some news articles to find some images and videos of these port backups in Southeast Asia. They are truly remarkable to see what's happening over there. Even though it's easing a little bit here, um, that's mostly coming over here in the next you know, 11 to 15, 16 days. So um, keep a watchful eye on that if you have a major dependency on ocean freight. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dean to walk us through our market update. Dean? Yeah, thanks, Ken. Um, yeah, the shortages of the week, there's a couple of things happening. Uh, Heineken in, in the uh, Netherlands own about 2,500 pubs in the UK. Uh, they've been rationing the number of kegs that are being shipped over there because there's a big shortage of beer and mixers, which if you've been to the UK, you'll know that's, um, that's catastrophic. It would be closely followed by something like that happening in Australia. Um, my wife uh, called last week to get some a new uh, recycling bin for her uh, catering business. Turns out that there's a shortage of steel and the carrier said, we can't get you any new uh, recycling bins until October. So that's five months out for a simple uh, recycling bin. Lots of shortages in the supply chain. We'll cover that a little bit later. Uh, and we're also covering the pallet shortage in the weekly market update that'll be out tomorrow. So let's get started with the load to truck ratio and dry van. Volumes bounced back last week. That was pretty predictable after the Memorial Day break. Uh, volumes are back up 11%, but more importantly, down 8% compared to the week prior to Memorial Day. Uh, down about 30% month over month. So there's definitely a trend where spot market volumes are cooling, not surprising given contract uh, prices are increasing. Net effect on the load to truck ratio, it dropped to 4.51, slight decrease from 4.77. Same story in refrigerated uh, load post volumes are down 10%, um, up 53% compared to the same time last year during produce season. Uh, equipment posts are the highest, and this is interesting, the weekly reefer equipment posts are the highest they've been all year. Uh, that's carriers posting their equipment for loads, normally an indicator that capacity is loosening slightly. Uh, that pushed the, the reefer load to truck ratio up to 9.10 last week. Flatbed uh, volumes bounce back predictably also, but they're down 8% month over month. They've been sliding for about five weeks now. Uh, equipment posts in flatbed were also the highest they've been all year. That had the combined effect of dropping the load to truck ratio down to 73.60. Uh, in the market condition index uh, charts, we're talking a little bit about the imports coming in, Ken touched on it in terms of the delays uh, coming at us on the ocean. But uh, volumes are up about 16% nationally in May, according to IHS market, up 22% in Los Angeles uh, and 40% in the port of Long Beach. Uh, Long Beach and Los Angeles are our number one and three ports. Still very healthy volumes pouring in. Uh, for comparison, there are about 60 container ships at berth in, at the end of January. There's 40 now, 4-0. So we've, we've got less uh, throughput going on right now or less, less ships at, at birth. Um, and compared to the big uh, delay on at January 30, there were 40 vessels at anchor. We're down to 10 today, and that's six fewer than Friday. So we're definitely getting on top.
type of things on the West Coast. Rates are still pretty high there, Los Angeles to Chicago. That's a big intermodal volume, about 30% of all intermodal moves on that lane. Uh, Truckload rates are up to 285, as high as 309 last week, excluding fuel. That's up, up almost a dollar per mile since January. Uh, nearby Ontario, rates are even higher at 309 and as high as 347. We expect those rates to remain pretty high on that lane out of Ontario and Los Angeles to Chicago, given all of that volume that's coming at us. And on the backhaul market out of Denver, uh, rates are interestingly uh, increasing up only three cents a mile to a buck sixty, uh, but that's uh, that, and as high as 260, 226. So a little bit of upward pressure on the backhaul rate there. Uh, for those loads. In the refrigerated sector, lots of volume coming across the border in Nogales. That's in the Phoenix refrigerated market. That's keeping rates high. In particular, to Hunts Point in the Brooklyn market, that's a 2,400 mile run for reefer carriers. Uh, rates are as high as 4.23 average. Uh, some loads are paying 4.44. That's up about a dollar and six per mile since April. So lots of uh, very high rates coming out of the border markets for produce. Ontario, California to Chicago, up to 3.61 last week. That's up a dollar 29 since January. Atlanta to Miami, one of the really big lanes for refrigerated and dry van. Reefer rates are up to 363 this week after being around 335 a mile. And that's, a, that's compensation for the drop in spot rates coming back out of Miami. Produce season's all but over down there. Rates have fallen to $2.16 a mile on the backhaul leg from Miami back to Atlanta. In the flatbed sector, uh, national volumes are sort of down. Um, spot rates are sort of plateauing, but short haul capacity is still very, very tight. Uh, Savannah to Greenville, uh, South Carolina, up to 537 a mile. It's only a 256 mile run, but some of the loads this week were paying $6 per mile. Uh, those rates have doubled since February when they were about 3.30 a mile. Uh, on the short haul run from Las Vegas to Salt Lake City, rates are up to 3.53 this week and as high as $4. Uh, rates on that lane have been steadily climbing since January, up almost a dollar since then. And um, and in lumber prices, uh, lumber July lumber future prices fell for the eighth straight day. They're under $1,000 per per board, thousand board feet, that's down 42% from the record high of $1,711 in early May. And that's up from the $400 in June last year. So uh, Wall Street Journal had a great article out yesterday talking about the, the that bubble may have, may have burst in terms of lumber prices. Uh, we still haven't seen it translate to the uh, consumer level just yet. Uh, wrapping up with our year over year look at spot rates, um, dry band spot rates lost almost all of the gains from the week prior. They dropped three cents a mile to 236, excluding fuel. They're still 76 cents a mile higher than this time last year and about 35 cents a mile higher than the same week in 2018. Uh, reefer rates uh, moved the most last week. They dropped five cents a mile over the course of the week to $2.70. Uh, they're still at record high levels, up 79 cents a mile compared to this time last year. And in flatbed, as Ken mentioned, they're still plateauing. Uh, There's a slight increase of less than 1%, uh, sorry, 1 cent per mile up to 270. They were 269 last week. This is the fourth week in succession where spot rates have been working in this really narrow 1 to 2 cent per mile range in terms of being up one week down the next. Uh, they're still 84 cents a mile higher than the same week last year and about 23 cents a mile higher than the same week in 2018. So that's it for this week's market update. If you'd like to learn more about what's happening in freight, go to dat.com forward slash market update and download our detailed weekly summary of what's happening in freight. That's it, Ned. Uh, over to you for the forecast. How <clears throat> pardon, howdy, everybody. Uh, we have a special treat for you this week. In addition to the normal short term forecasts, afterwards, we're going to be going into the long term forecast. So, um, you know, buckle yourselves in. So, we're going to start off by talking about the dry van forecasts. In blue, you can see the market rate observed by DAT. And then off to the right, you can see in green our rate cast model, in red our short term model, and in gold and silver our two blended forecasts, which are mixtures of the two models in different amounts and in different ways. Here you can see that there's actually a lot of model divergence, unlike last week. Ratecast is expecting that rates will be more or less maintained with a little bump heading into July 4th, and then it will start to slide back down towards the current level. On the other hand, the short-term model is expecting um, there to be a more or less continuous slide in rates with an interruption for July 4th, uh, heading down about, looks like, 10 cents a mile by the middle of July. I feel like the short-term model is being a little bit over-pessimistic here, but uh, I think that's actually going to be a topic of discussion for um, us later in the show, so keep your eyes peeled. And uh, the blended forecasts are leaning a little more towards the short-term model in this particular uh, model 
runs. Next up, we have the reefer uh, models. In blue is the market rate observed by DAT. In red is the short-term model. In green is our flagship rate cast model. And gold and silver are mixtures of the two models in different amounts and in different ways. Uh, you can see here that even though the there's a lot of tangly and, and it looks like there's model agreement. I, I'd say there's a fair bit of model divergence. Um, the rate cast model is expecting rates to really pick up heading into July 4th and then start bending back down, whereas the short term model is expecting more of a slow growth with, a, again, a peak heading into July 4th and um, just continued slow growth, maybe five cents over the next month. And the uh, short term models are a little bit leaning more, I'd say, towards the rate cast model in this particular set. Uh, finally, we're moving into the flatbed space where there is much broader model agreement. Once again, blue is the market rate observed by DAT. Red is the short term. Green is our flagship rate cast. And gold and silver are mixtures of the two models in different amounts and in different ways. Rate cast is expecting rates to pick up a little bit and then head back down. It's not a lot of movement, but a little bit of travel. Whereas short term is expecting basically a flat line with a bump heading into July fourth. Uh, that's about it for the short term models. So now we're going to be moving to the long term forecasts. All right. Um, All right. Do you want to start off by describing things, Ken, before we, we sure. go so, in the weeds? Yeah, let's level set on what is included in this chart. So we go way back in this chart. We go all the way to 2015. We try to capture at least a couple freight cycles or at least a couple halves. Uh, of freight cycles. So if we look, we're going back to 1 1 2015. The data underlying this chart is actually going back to January 2014, so we can get a good year over year change, which brings me to the gray little shaded area. That's the year over year percent change. So focus on the right axis, the right y axis there. On the left axis, you have the long haul rate per mile. Now, this is just the very long haul stuff. Most of our national reporting is to. Uh, 250 and above, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Yeah, so this is just 550 and above. We want to, there is still some amortization of fixed costs that happen between 250 and 550. So we just include 550 and above here. That's the blue line. That is the long haul rate view rate nationally over time. And then we move to the dotted lines. Dotted blue line is rate cast over the next 52 weeks. Dotted green line is the high case in the model, the optimistic case, the bear, bull case, however you want to think about it. The red line is the pessimistic case, the low case, the bear case, um, however you want to think about it. And then the shaded area in the future, it'd be really funky to try to show all three. So it just shows the kind of rate, rate cast mid case from a year over year change perspective. Does that summarize it pretty well? Okay. Yep. Uh, the only note I'm going to make is that uh, this is looking out one year, I believe, 52 weeks into the future, and it's using a slightly different model than our short-term forecast. It's the same basic algorithm, but it works a little bit differently because we're predicting long-term, different inputs and so such like. Correct. It's not as kind of disturbed by short-term reverberations. Yep. As you would hope from a long-term forecast. At least a good one. Uh, yeah. That's fair. All right, you want to That's walk fair. us through what it's, what, it's, what it's showing, Ned? Absolutely. So um, it's interesting to me here. Um, it's the, the kind of mid case is expecting a little bit of a slide. If you kind of uh, average out the bumps and wiggles, it's looking that it's heading down, but it's heading down very slowly. It's not really expecting a big reversion to mean, which, I mean, I think we were expecting a big reversion back to the, the overall historical mean in the earlier part of last year, and that didn't happen. So uh, the fact that the model is main, the mid case of the model is maintaining that level, I think is kind of interesting. Although the bear case is leaning a lot more towards heavy, um, pretty aggressive correction heading through the end of um, at least the uh, fall. Um, with a little bit of a bump heading into the holiday season. Well, um, yeah, Ned, it's, yeah. It's, I think one thing we should point out here is all yeah. models, well, I don't know, you correct me if I'm wrong, but most models at least will, the further you divert from the long-term trend, the more kind of violently and rapidly it's going to want to correct back in some of the more extreme yes. cases, right? Different models do different things, but yeah, no, the models that we general use tendency have, though. Yes, yes. So you can view the red line here as sort of snapping back. It would still be a rather large 
you know, increase over where we were even a year ago, year and a half ago, mm-hmm. I should say. But um, it is going to want to more rapidly get back to the long term trend. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Sorry the bull case, I, I think. Oh, out. no. By all means. Yeah. The bull yeah. case, I also think, is just a little bit interesting, not to spend too much time on it. It's just. The fact that there's a non-trivial, like again, this this the bull case is a non-trivial fraction of the model runs, and the fact that there is some seen upside, I think, is is interesting. I don't think it's going to materialize, but it is something you gotta you gotta be aware of the whole space of what your draws look like, and not just uh, what your your most common draws are going to be. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh, so next, we're going to move forward to the reefer rate unless anybody else has anything to say about the van rate the no this is forecast. the sauciest of the three so i'm, I'm curious <laughs> to hear dean um chime in on this one yeah yeah uh lines are the same uh gray is the year over year comps blue is the rate view rate just l- extreme long haul only and then off to the right are our three modeled rates the rate cast mid case in blue the rate cast bear or negative case in red and the rate cast bowl or positive case in green uh with year over year comps in the gray being on the right y-axis and the rate view rate and the models being on the left y-axis do you know anything jump out at you that you want to uh just the just the uh sort of inflection point around thanksgiving i, I I'm yeah. sort of intrigued by that i can see the july 4 uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later in terms of mm-hmm. uh, what we normally see around July 4 for dry van and reefer rates. But I'm, I'm interested in all three uh, in particular picking up something in, in November. Um, I mean, we always see lots of volume in reefer around Thanksgiving anyway, especially in the three weeks leading up to it when all those uh, fresh turkeys start moving. Not not mm-hmm. surprising. Yeah, one thing that I do want to call out is that there... Sorry, sorry to cut you off just a little bit. No. The, all the models or agree even. that there's going to be uh, a drop uh, or they all expect there to be a drop heading into the post uh, 4th of July. It, it differs mm-hmm. about the, the aggressiveness and the magnitude of the drop, but mm-hmm. there's kind of a consensus that there's going to be at least a little bit of a correction in reefer uh, post then. I'll, I'll be interested to see if that materializes. Yeah. Because yeah. the short term... <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, I mean, the most interesting thing to hear me here is that all three forecasts basically ignore the 4th of July. So is this, first of all, is this forecast un-American is the question we should be asking. I think that's, that's a good question. Uh, the second, but in all seriousness, um, it's interesting that a lot of the modeling that we're seeing is picking up the fact that we might not see a huge peak for the 4th mm-hmm. of July and we may just either plateau through it or already start kind of the post 4th of July decline early. Right. Right. Which would make sense, right? If there are shortages and everyone's worried mm-hmm. about having stuff on the shelves and having the hot right. dogs and, and right. barbecue grills and charcoal you need. Mm-hmm. It would make sense if you want to get it there sooner. Yeah. Um, and the volumes, the, ball. the volumes yeah. on the produce side just still aren't there yet, even though we're, restaurants are opening up quickly. Of course, they've got some uh, supply constraints on the employee side in terms of opening hours. And, uh, and they've yep. got supply chain disruptions in terms of, you know, the food, sa- the food supply chain has been incredibly disrupted in the last few weeks. So I suspect there may be some uh, drop off in demand. Uh, it may drop off pretty quickly because those rates have been elevated for a long time. And I think we theorized quite a few months ago that some of the July 4 peak had already been baked in way back in April. It, your models would suggest that's the case. I mean, there is a little bit of a bump around July 4th. Like if you've got if you've got sharp eyes, I don't think it's fair for you, Dean, without your glasses. Yeah. But uh, there's a little bit of a bump for July 4th. Right. But there's not like right. a sustained elevation of the rates um, post July 4th. Yep. Let's get on to flatbed. All right, flatbed. Flatbed is a lot more bearish. Again, blue is the very long haul rate view rate. Uh, the dotted lines. Blue is the flagship rate cast model uh, for long term. Red is the bearish or negative case rate cast model for long term. And green is the bullish or aggressive rate cast model for long term. Uh, the left axis is the rate view rate and the model rate. And the right is the year over year comps. And there is a lot of, I mean, even the bear, the bull case is expecting things to be basically flat through the end of the year and the the midline and the bear case are really expecting a mean reversion mm. so i think if you're in the flatbed space it will be interesting to see whether or not that materializes 
I mean, you think about where they are right now, right? They're both mm-hmm. reefer and flatbed, including fuel, at about 310 per mile, which is yeah. unbelievably high. And it's definitely hitting that ceiling that we, we typically see. Um, so yeah. that, that, would, that would explain some of that downward you know, sort of deflationary pressure we're seeing. Mm-hmm. I think the models are really starting to see some of the air come out of the balloon, if you will. The terrible. That was a terrible phrase, but, um, <laughs> you know, I, I think it, we're running yeah. out of gas, running out of steam, maybe back it up with a couple better ones there. But um, this is exactly what happened if you kind of look back in the chart to 2018, right? So yep. right around this time, yep. Yep. things tipped over a ledge and then really, really, really came back down hard. I don't know if that's going to be the case, though, this year. I mean, I know lumber yeah. prices are down. We were chatting before the show. But, mm. again, I, I was just at a home improvement store yesterday morning and uh, – I mean, it, nothing changed. Um, so, yeah, no, I think it's going to be really interesting to see what happens in the tail end of the year, especially for flatbed and reefer. Yeah. All right. All right. Go ahead. Ask a cute question of the week. Sure. All right. Um, rates dropped again last week. Will we see the typical July fourth peak again? Well, that was some foreshadowing. <laughs> From the it was. <laughs> uh, maybe I'll kick it off and then turn it over to Dean just to kind of level set people on who maybe not familiar. We get a lot of new industry participants that join our show on a weekly basis. So Fourth of July, we talk about pretty much all spring um, heading up to the holiday, not because we're patriots, but because, well, in addition to being patriots. Yes, because, thank you. Um, it is a major kind of uh, what I would call like a highway mileage marker in the freight calendar. Um, there's a lot of momentum carried among the three equipment types that we track into the fourth produce being the primary driver. Uh, but things usually um, start off slow after Christmas, right? It's uh, January, the second half of January, most of February and very early March tend to be slow as produce picks up in late March, early April, things start to build and build and build. Uh, May, June, and July culminating on the 4th, depending on when it falls from a calendar perspective, are some of the busiest times in the freight calendar. And then pretty much right after 4th, um, things tend to slow down until we get into retail. 4th also signals, you know, July 1st signals the start of Q3, uh, end of H1, start of H2 of the year. Um, so there's a lot of things going on, which is why we put so much focus on the fourth. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dean to kind of fill us in on what might be happening this year. Yeah, I, I had a look at the USDA data yesterday for the weekly number of truckloads that get moved domestically. Uh, volumes are trending downwards. So month over month, volumes are sliding. We had a big surge in volume around uh, Memorial Day, which is not uh, you know, unsurprising. Um, uh, surprising, sorry. We, but we're down 22% year over year. What's that mean in terms of truckloads? That's about 7,400 full truckloads of produce fewer this week compared to the same week last year. On the import side across the southern border, it's about 1,500 fewer truckloads. So we're down We're down in terms of volume, but it's trending uh, the wrong direction in terms of providing enough volume. Now, that said, as we covered a little bit earlier, there are some lanes that are on fire right now, in particular those markets out of Laredo, um, Far Texas, Nogales, those markets that are bringing in some of those exotic volumes like avocados from Mexico. Uh, some, I think so there'll be some markets uh, that'll be pretty hot. You know, California was hot last week with cherries. We'll start to see Twin Falls, Idaho and the Yakima Valley start to come online soon with cherries. So I think there'll be uh, pretty good rates for carriers, um, uh, not so much for shippers in some markets where there's tight capacity overall because there'll be uh, timing around crops. We will see some upward movement, I think, because um, generally there are some growers that, um, you know, time their crops like strawberries, cherries in particular, for the Independence Day celebration. So I think we'll see some upward pressure, but really at a, at a three-digit zip level, you know, in a, in a small geographic area. It won't be sort of on the national level, but there'll be some uh, uh, high rates, I think, being paid for some of those volumes that are being timed around some of the market uh, seasons. Yeah, I think it's going to be... <clears throat> I, I'm of the camp that I expect there to be at least a little bit of a bump. A lot of the short-term models are expecting there to be at least a little bit of a bump heading into July 4th. Um, whether or not that's the peak or whether there's going to be some deflationary on the other side, I expect it to be deflationary, but I think that there is going to be less of a peak than you might have seen in prior mm-hmm. years. Yeah, yep. And it's also going to depend heavily on equipment type. 
Ken, you got right. anything else? No, I, I, I think the least surprising outcome would be if things kind of stay where they are through the, the turn of the turn of the half, if you will. Um, mm -hmm. And then ease as we head into the dog days of summer. I mean, it wouldn't be altogether kind of beyond the pale for things to spike up a bit. Um, and, you know, cause you have end of month, end of quarter holiday, all that stuff culminates on the 4th of July. I haven't had really time to look. I think the fourth falls on a weekend this year is fall on a Sunday. I think that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Cause the, the fifth is a, a Monday. So yeah. So yeah, yeah it's going to be interesting to watch and we're not that far away. Right. So we'll keep you informed. That's for sure. All right. So you want to move on to our, we have a bunch of questions piled up. Ned, do you want to yes. move into those? I'm not sure we're going to be able to, yeah, I'm not sure we're going to be able to handle them all, but I think it'll be uh, interesting. A uh, question from Anthony. Going into freight brokering, but would like to work for a larger company under their umbrella. Can you give me any advice? Find a good agency, right? I mean, if you're going to incorporate as your own broker, there are a lot of, we're not going to name drop any, right? Because a lot of them are, or not all of them are our customers. Um, but I think if you kind of do your research, maybe network some folks on LinkedIn um, that are in the industry and who have kind of signed on with agencies, um, especially agent model brokers, that might be a really good way to do what you're trying to do. But um, maybe Dean or Ned have a counter opinion there. I, nope. I would agree with you, Ken, on that. All right. All right. Gary. Gary asks, and this is a question directed straight at me at my heart, do your statistics not account for outliers? And the answer, Gary, is that A, it depends because some models we do do some outlier trimming and in some models we don't. And B, uh, by definition, outliers are not things that affect like the bulk of the... I mean, not to go back to, to trilling too hard on the normal distribution, but like stuff out at the tails moves things a little bit. But if you're interested in the bulk of where things are, you need to look at the center of the distribution. And outliers are that. They're outliers. Sometimes you need to incorporate them. Sometimes you need to trim them. It really depends on what you're trying to do. So uh, I can't answer, do my statistics not account for outliers? But I can answer that some of our models do account for outliers, and some of them trim them. And if you want to have a more detailed conversation about what goes into which, uh, you can email me at askiq at dat.com, and I will talk so much, so much about this. <laughs> uh, com quick comment from Jordan. It's not <laughs> the same without Dean's glasses on. I, I take an IQ hit, clearly. Yeah. <laughs> I think his glasses help him see the freight markets even better, is what Jordan was alluding to. <laughs> yes. <laughs> OK. Yeah. It's, uh... Oh, boy. And then we have some really detailed questions from Adam. So uh, why don't we handle the um, forecast reflecting the push by Amazon to grab drivers? Uh, specifically, the text is, uh, curious how the forecasts reflect the current push by Amazon to grab drivers. They are advertising to beat the spot market rates by 70%. Has this been reflected in the model, or has this uh, not yet to be included? Um, I would say, in general, our modeling approach is to try not to model specific actions of specific businesses explicitly. Uh, because if you do that, if you add too many sort of, I'm going to use the term epicycle, which is not fair, but like if you're trying to model the behavior of every single player in the market, frequently you will end up doing a worse job than if you're trying to look at the overall picture. I think that um, the model will react if this proves to be like a big draw on drivers and, and takes capacity out of the rest of the market. But it is not something that we do not model the explicit actions of any participant, even if they're um, someone like Amazon. Do you guys have anything well, to add? I mean, so not to, I mean, so I'm trying to think of a politically correct way to kind of talk about this, but Amazon's not that important in freight. And that, that's not really a hot take either. I mean, so even if they move, let's just say, let's, Let's assume that they are 4x their actual size and they're moving roughly $5 billion of spot freight a year. They're still, what is five out of 80 to 100 billion? So it's still under 10% of the total spot market. CH Robinson's the largest player in the brokerage industry. 
at what roughly twelve and a half to fifteen billion dollars, depending on where fuel and and uh, and, and rates shake out. Um, and we wouldn't adjust our model specifically for them either. So um, I think there's some other debates when you're like looking not at the spot market. I think if you're UPS or FedEx or regional parcel delivery networks and you're interested in kind of that dynamic between drivers um, or, or, or package handlers or couriers shifting between those industries, I think that's a much more um, impactful question. Uh, but as far as truckload freight, um, in their non-asset division, I'm not, I don't think that they have as much of a weight as, 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 as is perceived. Um, strongly disagree, agree. Am I crazy? No, no, I, I think you're, you're right. I think that everybody is being really aggressive about grabbing drivers and, you know, Amazon has a big name and a lot of money coming in from other elements of the business, but I don't think that they're unique in trying to poach drivers. And maybe they're being a little more aggressive because uh, Jeffy, my close personal friend, uh, has a little bit more cash to throw around, so he's willing to to pay more aggressively. But I don't think it's that different than than other participants in the market. No, I wonder what the spot rate is on that trip to space he's taking. That eleven minute trip to space. <laughs> uh, do we have time for one more question? Yeah, hit it. yeah, we're fine. We have a few more minutes. Matt asks, are you seeing any shift in consumer spending from goods and services and the related impact on freight? I think the one thing before Dean jumps in, I'll, I'll take the bullet for this one. I think one of the things we got wrong was assuming there, there's a lot more shipping that's involved with the ship sh shift to services than we had anticipated, which I think is one of the reasons why we're seeing rates remain elevated. Hmm. Even though we've seen a shift to consumer, there's a lot of things that need to ship that maybe paper plates and forks and napkins and knives and spoons and, and all the food service goods and uh, trash bins, bus bins, all of the stuff that needs to go out there to help the service economy um, that still needs to move. And a lot of those inventories were apparently very, very low and needed to be restocked. So yep. Yep. Um, things are moving. No doubt about it. Yeah, the, um, the only comment I would have is something that um, uh, Professor Kaplis talked about last week in his uh, latest report, and he said that they're seeing both increase. There was a the theory that we would see less on goods and more on services once the economy reopened. Um, from what he's been seeing, and, and according to his shippers, the people are still spending on both. So there's been, at the moment, no discernible difference between spending on goods or services just yet in terms of how it impacts the freight market. Um. Do you think that, I mean, it seems weird to me that consumer spending can be up on both, um, but I guess that's just a function of the way that things are, like wages are going up uh, in a lot of the, a lot of industries. So maybe, maybe it is the case that there's just like overall more consumption, but I would be, it would be interesting to see as some things get unwound, what is going to happen. Yeah, but well, we're spending as the economy reopens. We're spending on different things now. You know, I bought a yeah. bunch of beach chairs on the weekend for the beach. So yeah. last year, last year it was chairs for the outdoor garden setting. So I think I think a lot of that's going on also as the economy reopens and people get back to some form of normalcy. They're spending on other things that they maybe put off over the last year. Yeah, I think that's right. Uh, Darren right. asks, "Do we have time for this last one?" Yeah, no? go for it. Okay, Darren asks, so trucking will slow down after July 4th. Did I hear correctly? I feel like that's kind of the consensus. Yep. I mean, every year we have on record other than last year, that's happened. Even like if you think back to the insane year of like 2017, where um, what was that Harvey and Irma and then ELDs mm -hmm. still, though, after the 4th of July, things slowed down before they went absolutely nuts that year. So, yeah. Things slow down. Things slow down this year. If you can remember that far back, we saw this huge drop in rates after return season in uh, mid January, right before they kind mm -hmm. of before the polar vortex hit. Rates were dropping mm -hmm. considerably, yeah. double digit percentage drops. So yeah. let's yeah. um let's not forget the fundamentals. Um, I, we should wrap the fundamentals in the context of what's happening now, but let's not forget the, the fundamentals of the freight calendar. Yeah, right. I agree. Anything to add there, Dean? Um, other than it's um, vacation season, um, you know, where I am in New England, people head to the lake or the beach and, and consumption changes. You know, people are buying 
different things over the course of the summer. They're not normally where they would be. So I think that has a material impact on on freight volumes, particularly on the on the consumer packaged goods side. That's a really good point. All right, I'm going to wrap us up. We're hitting hitting up against time here. So thank you everyone for joining us and for your questions. If we couldn't get to anything or you think of something ask iq at dat.com we actually had a bunch roll in last week i think that was a function of us not being able to get to all the questions and so we try our best to get back to those as quickly as possible um we have dean's market update um that you can find on our website Um, it's just chock full of information and kind of easier to grab charts and graphs and anything you might want to throw into a presentation we also have father's day coming up this weekend so make sure you get a tacky tie um some golf balls and tees or something like that um for all the dads out there and am I missing anything, guys? Kind of a um, light week. Texas folks, stay safe. There might be some more power outages coming. Oh, yeah. 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 Is yeah. that ERCOT related? No, we don't have time yes. to find it now. I'll have to look yeah, into no, it. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, with that, we will okay. see you next week at 10 Eastern, 7 Pacific. Okay. And we hope you have Thank a great you. rest of your week. Bye, everyone. Okay. Thanks. Bye. Bye, Z.